Dan talked about is when you see your DUI driver and what do you do, okay? Uh, a, you want to try and observe them if you can, keep them in sight, direction of travel. Uh, you know, help us get to them and find them. Uh, don't, you know, <clears throat> it, it's going to be hard for you from an experience standpoint to determine if they're DUI and, and if so to what degree, unless they happen to be the kind that are going from ditch to ditch and knocking down street signs and mailboxes and all that, then it's pretty simple. Uh, but if you have some doubt that it may be a DUI, call the Sheriff's Office, the 669 uh, They're going to want a description of the car, they're going to want a tag number if you can get it, and a direction of travel. And the longer that you can keep them in sight and maintain that direction of travel and where they are, the quicker we'll get to them and locate them. But you don't want to chase them. If they're, if they're driving wild and they're going on, they're just going on. You know, last time I saw them, they were you know, running at least 80, eastbound on 280, you know, uh, past hatchers or whatever, you know, wherever you call it off. Uh, but you will see them. We're seeing not necessarily the alcohol DUI all the time. Now we're seeing a fair number of prescription medication DUIs. People who have abused, overused pain medication, things of that nature that are, you know, as, as what we would call the old drunk, just as drunk as you can get, only there's no alcohol involved. And what we generally do there is we arrest them for driving under the influence and have to do uh, either a consensual or a search warrant blood test to determine the, the, uh, what they're under the influence of because there's no smell of alcoholic beverage. Uh, but if you see that, if you got any belief that it's a DUI driver, get the description of the car, the tag number, direction of travel, call it in and let us get to them and stop them. They're fine, they're fine. Uh, made the point they may be having diabetic reactions. You know, you may end up be doing somebody a great big favor. So uh, uh, don't feel, and don't feel bad if they're not. I mean, if you call us and we stop somebody and they're okay, that's fine. Because believe me, we stop people all the time that we have suspicions about that are okay. You know, and, and maybe they're tired, maybe they just weren't paying attention. Uh, you know, maybe they were changing radios, or channels, or, or, or maybe they were lighting a cigarette or whatever it might have been. You know, and, and they, they dropped off the road a little bit. Uh, don't feel bad if it turns out that they're, they're not intoxicated. That's okay. Uh, we're certainly not going to stop them and tell them, look, you see that car back there? <laughs> <laughs> they call us on it. One of the things that I have seen that's, that's somewhat difficult to do or to comprehend is that you are very hard to see in low light darkness, crisis situations because of the low light number one and the flashing red, blue, green headlights, all of the activity. Are now with dark pants and the light colored shirt. The light shirt seems to you know, show up a little bit better. But the key is y'all are going to get orange traffic vest. Get those things on because they really reflect the light and make you so much easier to see. People coming by or to a wreck scene or a crisis scene get mesmerized by all the lights and all the activity and they're trying to figure out what's happened and where is it. And they simply don't see you in the road trying to help them. They just don't see you. They're not looking for you. So what, what I'm going to suggest that you do, number one, is you position yourself with an escape route. Don't, don't get out in the road where your minivan or your SUV or whatever is right here and you're right here beside it, right in the middle. You can't run. You got nowhere to go but get pinned against your own car. Get, if the car is parked here and the green lights are flashing and the headlights are aimed down the road, you get out here in the headlights where you got nothing impeding you leaving the road and heading off in the, in, in the trees. Because you're going to have to run sooner or later. Somebody, you're going to see the fact that you got to get out of there. Always have yourself an escape route. Don't pin yourself in. 
get where you have access. Don't get out in the middle of the road. Get close to the edge where you can leave. Okay? Try and get yourself in those headlights kind of thing where that reflective vest is showing you up to the best possible advantage. Your hand signals. Somebody driving towards you at 40 miles an hour and they're 150, 175 feet away and their headlights only go out that distance and your hand signals are right here at your body, they'll never see them. They'll never have a clue what you're trying to tell them to do. They'll never see them. <clears throat> you got to get them big. You got to get them out. You, you, you got to, if you're going to want them to turn, you know, go in this lane, you got to make them big, <coughs> sweeping motions. And I usually point. I point with this hand and do this with the other hand where they see them. Same thing with a flashlight. If you got the flashlight on and you're just doing something like this, they don't have a clue what you're trying to say. If you've got the flashlight and you're doing this, they can see the sweeping motion that you're wanting them to. What I do to, to stop is I do this. Big, wide swing. I want you to stop. You know, I don't want you going anywhere. You know, If you're just standing there shining it at them, they don't know what that means. They don't have a clue what that means. You know, first off, they can't see through it and they're mad. So don't shine it in their eyes, but use it to make big, wide, sweeping aims of what you want them to do. And I, I use my free hand to point so that they can see me when I get in their lights. They got the vest. They got a motion draw in their eye. And then I'm pointing that I want them to go this side of the fire truck or this down this lane of the interstate or the two end. Uh, you know, they're, they're fairly obvious right or left if you want them to go this way or you want them to go that way. The stop, you know, if it's daylight and they can see me, I'll get one hand up and the other one like this so that they understand I want them to come to a halt. You know, with the light at night, I like to do down here at my feet where, they, where they've got a clear indication I want them stopped. You know, uh, you've got to be really careful if you're moving your hands with a stop motion because they don't know what that means. Just one, one hand frozen and the other one doing something down here that, that indicates, whoa. Um, I point at people a lot. If you got two lanes of traffic and, and you want one to stop and one to go, I make eye contact and point. And I make sure that one's looking at me. And I tell him, you stay right there. And then I point at this one over here. And when I know I got eye contact there, I let them know I want your, your lane to go on. So I make eye contact and I point a lot to make sure we're all communicating with each other. Part of what you'll do is communicate with the partner who may be directing traffic on the other end of this deal. Uh, you may be at one end, they may be at the other, and you're going to take turns letting your traffic go. We yell a lot. If we got the rock walkie-talkies, you know, we can talk. But you want to make absolutely sure that your partner knows what you're doing. If you've got your stopped, you're going to yell, mine are stopped, your way. You know, let them know, okay, let yours go. I got mine stopped here. And then when they get their lane going and they get through, they ought to yell back at you. Mine are stopped, you can let yours go. Yell at each other so that there's no, I let mine go, she lets hers go, and <laughs> right in the middle we have, uh oh. Be careful, y'all. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, 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 that's apt to be a fairly common occurrence because if you have a disabled vehicle or an accident or whatever, you're frequently down to one lane. Mm -hmm. And that would put us logically in the situation of doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in a place Especially where. Especially if your guys aren't there. Yeah, if, if we're not here then, yet, and there may be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that involved before we actually get to you, you know, that'll seem like a long time. If you're in a dangerous place where you found the car, go back up the road and get around the curve and get that traffic slowed down. Don't stay right at the disabled car because it's a, coming around a dead end curve and all, I mean a blind curve and all of a sudden they're doing 55 and whoa, here you are. Get in your car, turn around, go back up the road, Get the other side of that blind curve, get your lights flashing, and then if you don't do anything, stand on the side of the road, and as people go by, just 
slow down, slow down, slow down. And you're letting them know something's up there. You know, take it easy as you go on around. Use your four-way flashers. In addition to the green light, get in the habit of kicking on your four-way flashers anytime you stop your vehicle for anything. Kick on your four-way flashers. <coughs> um, yes, sir. Another thing that people appreciate, too, is that you can stop at another intersection somewhere that it can also serve as a detour. If it's gonna, traffic's going to be blocked for a long time, like the way it's brought up out there or something like that, and the road is blocked, then suggest to them, go around this way, you'll save a lot of time. And they appreciate it. Yeah, because yeah, it gets frustrating if, you're, if it's bad wreck, both lanes are closed down, Everybody stop and, and you just let them keep piling up and stop, stop, stop. You know, and they're going to be there 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes till the helicopter comes, loads, and leaves. If there's, a, if there's an alternate route of travel, we might get there and ask you to go up the road, turn everybody to the left. Tell them, look, take, take this road over to here and go around because it's going to be 45 minutes before this is over. And, and basically what we'll do, too, is we'll turn around the traffic that's there and send them back on that side to take that detour so we clear it up as much as possible. But if that's an option, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and get up there and tell everybody, take the detour here. If you don't want to sit here, it's going to take a long time. And these things will come to you. They're not going to happen the first wreck or two. You're going to have to go to some, see some, watch what goes on, figure out, well, we didn't do that quite right. We'll have to do it a little different next time. That's all this is. It's just a matter of some practical experience, seeing a few of them, and then it'll start coming, making sense and working fine for you. I'm sure you get a lot of healthy feedback from the people when you're screwing up. <laughs> Occasionally, folks will tell you what, <laughs> yeah, their opinion of what yeah. you're doing. <laughs>
there, we don't even turn on the lights and sirens. We can get almost as fast to the location we're going without them because we create such a mess with them. People stop in the middle of the road in front of you. Y'all got to, if you're, if you're driving and running that green light, look out because the car in front of you is liable to stop dead in the road not knowing what you are. I'd wait till I was at the spot to turn it off. Because, I mean, honest to God, we have them, we have them look in the rearview mirror and stop and go like, what do I do? You know, because there's nowhere to get off right or left. There's no shoulders on a lot of the roads and areas. And and they absolutely panic. And they'll stop. You can't get in the media. No. there. Yeah. I, you know, today, if you got room to pull over to the right and slow down and give the emergency vehicle as much room as possible, do that. But like you say, on 280, half the time, you can't go anywhere. I used to pass, I'd get off in the median or I'd get off on the shoulder and go slow because what will happen is somebody will pull off on me. You know, but, but you can't. You, you do, you make better time with no lights and no siren if you're in those kind of congestions. You just, just go with the traffic, kind of look for the lane that's moving better and, you know, do the best you can, but you create more of a traffic jam than you help. I know a lot of times on 280, you get in a situation there where it's just like you say, just stopped. A lot of the people, you know, the ones in the right lane move to the right, the ones in the left move to the left, and they kind of open up the lane down the middle right there. Mm -hmm. About the best you can do in a situation like that. Sometimes out here on 280, we've had such traffic backups because of a wreck that we can't get the wrecker to the scene, we can't get the ambulance to the scene because it's so congested and it backs up through some intersections. And, you know, if you back up through 47, and that one, that two-lane road is blocked going down. There's nothing you can do. There's nowhere to, you know. And we've had problems getting records. And about all you can do is hope people will look at that and do as much as they can to all go one way and, and give you an opening. I have gone like five miles on I-65 in the median and in the shoulders trying to get to something because it backed up so bad. It was a uh, July the 4th wreck and actually in Chilton County. It happened just below Calera, and it was actually in Chilton County. And there was a number of fatalities, and it was the July 4th traffic. And it was backed up from in Chilton County all the way up to Alabaster. And we had a terrible time. Because unfortunately, some of the trucks, thinking they were doing a favor, would pull off on the shoulder. And you think you're doing great because you're in the right-hand shoulder. And boom, you come up here, and here's a truck stopped. And the, you know, so then you got to get folks to let you get over to the median side and work your way up. Uh, Y'all won't have a big problem with that because you've got a lot of different accesses right in here that you know people can turn around, get off of. <coughs> you got you got more ability to maneuver in this stretch right in here than, than some areas do. But if you have a wreck on some of the two lanes, 47, uh, 49, 36, 69, some of that, you could have some places where it back up pretty hard to deal with. Uh, again, you want to get to a safe, visible spot where you put your car. Doesn't matter how far back from the scene you have to get, you want to get to where people have got plenty of room to see you and adjust their driving and slow down and be safe. Because, uh, well, we talked last time, you see where people get out to help a wreck and another car comes barreling in and hits the existing wreck and really hurts the folks because you're out of your vehicle and you're, you know, you're very vulnerable. Don't let that happen. Keep that escape route. And if, and if there's a possibility of, of it's not safe, <coughs> stay away. Get anybody that's there, that's, that's mobile, that can move away from the cars. Get get way away from them. And if somebody's hurt and can't move, don't move them. Leave them right there and wait till the, you know, the right folks get the help. But get the ones that are mobile and can away from the, the wreck itself in a safe place where they wouldn't be injured by another car. Uh, questions on any of the traffic or hand signals or whatever? Anything? Okay. Well, I think I said all I know. Um, yes, sir. Just a quick question on the uh, 911 versus the dispatch number. I understand you know, 911 only on life threatening or property threatening. Situations. What's the difference of response, or how does it? I'm just curious. To, you know. All right. 
the difference is, is minute. <coughs> But 911 handles all the fire and all the rescue. So if it's a if it's a fire or a personal injury situation, the first thing you want headed that way is fire and rescue. So 911 will get that going faster than if you call us because we're going to have to call 911. If <coughs> the need is for law enforcement in an emergency situation and you call 911, 911's got a one button transfer to us. We don't have a one-button transfer to them. We have to dial them. But they've got a phone system with a one-button transfer that shuttles that call right to us. So it might cost you 10 seconds for a law enforcement response, but it'll save you time in the fire and rescue response. So I would opt for 911 on any emergency situation, life or property, where someone's you know, injured, somebody could be injured, or there could be serious property fire related problems. You know, the other way around, if you call us with it and then we do need rescue, then our dispatchers have got to dial the number and tell the story again. So I'd rather you go the other way. I'd rather you call 911 first and let them get the fire and rescue started. I mean, I'll be honest with you, from a deputy sheriff's standpoint, the best news I can get on a bad wreck is the fire department to beat me there. You know, I want to see that the rescue and the fire department and the medical people are already there, if possible. So I'd rather them get started first and then us. Because their, their work's a lot more critical from a time standpoint than ours is. Let, let me add to that. I met with the director of 911 today and talked about this program and asked him to brief his operators, which he's done. Um, and he specifically invited or, or asked if he could host one of our meetings probably about May when they move into their new center over at the uh, county operations building. And he said they have a meeting room. <coughs> we can conduct our meeting. They'll give us a tour of their operation, show us what's going on. They will have just moved in and settled down. But, it, but he had a real simple guideline. He said, if you have an emergency, you need people right now, call 911. You know, you need fire, rescue. Well, he said they can help you sort out what you need. They'll get, a, get everybody rolling. If you see this guy, at uh, the Griffin Mart, call the other number. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it's a judgment thing, but if, if you've got anything that's just super urgent emergency, you got to have emergency vehicles, whatever, just call 911. Don't even think twice. If there's a doubt in your mind, call 911. A lot of the routine stuff we do, we'll call these guys. But when it happens and it's hot and your heart rate's up here, call 911. The point was made, too, and you may have heard it on the news playing the 911 tape back on that child that drowned up in Birmingham and they were playing it on TV and they were playing it with family members there. I'm going to tell you that wouldn't happen down here. Uh, Sheriff Jones wouldn't sit in the room where they were going to play a 911 tape on the death of a four-year-old child and have that grandmother sitting in that room. That would not happen. If she wanted to hear that tape, she could hear it in the privacy of somebody's office with no news media around that would but anything you say on that 911 tape is recorded. Anything you say to us is recorded. So you do want to try and be professional, get your message across, and, and uh, bear in mind that there is the possibility that those tapes will end up in court or you know, be subpoenaed for, for what was said or how it was said or how it was handled. Uh, so just bear in mind all that stuff is recorded. And I'll tell you something, that's, that's for our protection, your protection. We get complaints about how something was handled, and we play the tapes back in 999 times out of a thousand. It was done right. You know, it was done exactly as it should have been, and the tapes proved it. Uh, and that's what it would do for you. They'll prove that you did what you're supposed to have done, how it was supposed to be done, and people's perception of time and of incidents. You know, some of the people sit on those tapes, they were put on hold for several minutes. And what was proven was that they already had, I think, six or seven incoming calls on the grounding, already had it underway, and I think somebody was put on hold for one minute. But it was the seventh call in on the same situation, so that's why we recorded it. I'd, I'd like to do a little exercise now. Uh, I want each of you, we're going to take, take a break, but you're going to work while we break. I want each of you to take a couple minutes and just think about a situation. You're out on the COP patrol, and you come up on some situation.
situation. Write down a note or two about that situation, and then I'm going to select a handful of you, and we're going to talk about that situation, talk about what we're going to do in that situation with Chris's guidance. How's that sound? For okay. Okay. Okay.
issue of liability has been mentioned and, and covered here, and, and I want to tell you that doesn't bother me the least. Uh, we are in a, a society where that's a, a, a constant, constant problem. But it doesn't bother me in the least for what you folks are going to do about your liability or about the liability of the town of Chelsea. Because it's a very simple procedure. If you follow the rules and you do what you're supposed to do here, there is no liability. There is no concern. Uh, and and I, I, don't, I didn't give that a thought. The sheriff didn't give it a thought. Unfortunately, we get sued coming and going. Uh, but that's because of the, the nature of it. And, and it doesn't bother us. And, and we don't lose hardly any of them. I can honestly tell you that your sheriff's office hadn't cost your county much money uh, other than defending ourselves. The biggest majority of those lawsuits, we win because we got policies and procedures, and we adhere to those policies and procedures, and and we have the ability to document that we're doing exactly what we're supposed to do and expected to do, and and it hasn't been an issue, uh, so that doesn't bother me. Confidentiality is an issue that is important. To me. Uh, you you will hear things that the general public will not know. You will be aware that we know there are some burglars or possibly some dopers or possibly some uh, car thieves that are operating. And you may know who we think they are. We may show you pictures of them. We may show you the car they're driving or a tag number. But you can't tell everybody that information because their aunt or brother or cousin or former running buddy may live out here or may visit out here. And we don't want to tell them off that we're on to them. So what you hear, what you know, what you see in the course of a patrol, you keep it to yourself. And I, I do this uh, as a way that you, this is the way you want to be treated and you treat somebody this way. If you happen to go with the deputy because you see him turn up the street and he's answering a call where there's a, a domestic dispute and there's been a little disagreement between uh, cohabitors of a home, you don't want all your neighbors to know what goes on in your house. If, if you and, and your spouse happen to get into a disagreement, you don't want everybody up and down the street to know who said what to whom. It's none of their business. So you may you may become privileged to something like that, or know that there was a dispute there. Leave it at that. It's not important. You don't want it. You don't. You wouldn't want to be the topic of conversation, and don't make somebody else the topic of conversation. Um, the uh, I, I'll tell you this real quickly and. and so you're not shocked. When we talk about confidentiality, you're probably going to hear very shortly that the Shelby County Sheriff's Office is being sued by the Birmingham News. Now, we hadn't made any announcements of this. I'm probably this is the first time we brought it up. Hadn't been filed yet. It may not, but I believe it's going to. And the issue is confidentiality. We believe that you as a citizen have a right to a certain amount of privacy that the Birmingham News has no right to see and hear everything that you say and do to a law enforcement officer. The issue being, when you're speaking to a law enforcement officer, if you happen to be the victim of a crime, uh, innocently, if you happen to witness a crime, what you say to us, you're not holding a press conference. They want to be able to come to our office and look at everything that you said and told us. I'll give you a brief example. You come in and say, I saw your officers across the street last night. I believe that that man that lives in that house is selling drugs. And his name is such and such. And on Tuesday nights, there'll be a big crowd over there about 10 o'clock. And we make a report of that. The Birmingham News thinks they have a right to review that. We don't. So we have told them, no. We have told them, we're not giving you names. We're not giving you specifics. You're not looking at those reports. We had an incident where a young girl had skipped school, gone with a couple of boys, you know, bad decision. I'm sure there was some alcohol or drugs involved. She got home, told her mother she'd been raped. Mother calls us, we made a report. They were made aware that there was an alleged rape that occurred, that it was a 16-year-old girl and she'd skip school. And she knew the uh, perpetrators. They said, what school did she go to? The sheriff said, I'm not going to tell you. Well, they tell us in Birmingham. We said, 
It doesn't matter. This didn't happen at school. This, this was not a school property situation. It didn't happen at school. It was a 16-year-old girl, period. And they believe they had a right to know what school she went to. You know as well as I know that if it was printed in the paper that a 16-year-old girl, Chelsea High School student, was raped, you know what's going to go on in the community, don't you? <clears throat> Everybody's going to be upset. They're going to want all the details, and they're going to figure out who she is. They're going to figure out who wasn't in school, and who is she? So we refuse. So there's been some instances like that. That's how strongly we feel about confidentiality. We're going to protect the victims of crime and their families. We're going to protect, protect the witnesses of crime and their families. We're going to protect the officers involved in a situation. We don't release the name of an officer involved in a shooting. We don't. We are going to protect the quality of the investigation so that the prosecution of that crime is successful. It doesn't do a bit of good to arrest a person and lose the deal in court, or it's not our job to try it in the media. So that's where we're coming from. That's how strongly we feel about confidentiality. We're going to do everything in our power to protect the citizens of this county in their privacy. Now, we're not going to not talk about crime. If we have a problem with, with a string of daytime burglaries, we're going to do a press release and say, everybody, watch out, look out. We're getting hit by daytime burglars. We have a string of car thefts. I tell you, in past history, we had a, uh, a rape on the north end of the apartment complex. In our investigation, we discovered that another jurisdiction, Hoover, had had one close by in the Hoover city limits. Jefferson County had had one in the Jefferson County city limits within a two or three week period, if I'm remembering right. This was the one called the Slasher, if you remember. We'd only had one rape, but when our investigation in less than 24 hours connected the possibility of two more within a couple of miles, we called a press conference and said, if you live in an apartment, if you live on the ground floor, you know, here's what you need to do. So we're gonna, we're gonna deal with the media and provide all the information we can possibly provide that's gonna be uh, to their benefit, it's going to protect you if there's a crime. <coughs> but we're not going to tell them your name. You know, tell you what else they can do. That report has your name, your social security number, your date of birth, your physical description, your home address, your home phone number, your place of business, your business phone number. Any of you who like to play on the internet, what could you do with that information in just a short period of time? You could have false IDs. You could make all kind of purchases. You could get credit cards. You know, you could have a bomb with that kind of information. So we're not going to give it to them. Point being, respect what you learn and see out here and keep it to yourself. Some cases, and the sheriff will tell you this, and I'll tell you this, we don't go home and tell our wives. He'll tell you, I don't tell Debbie everything that goes on in that office, but cops. In at Berkeley, she might be talking to a friend of hers and say something by mistake. So keep it within the confines. All right. <clears throat> Enough on that. Um, all right. First thing we've talked about is reporting what you see. There's two avenues to do that. One is a pure emergency situation, which is a dial 911. This is going to be a car wreck, a fire, uh, somebody screaming for help, uh, you know, an obvious fight, things of that nature. Life-threatening, property-threatening emergencies. Those are 911 calls. That hooks you up immediately to 911, who has fire and rescue, and if it needs us, they will, they will one-button patch us and they'll listen, the 911 operator will stay on the line, and the sheriff's office, the dispatcher, will be on the line. So emergency situations are 911 dial. Okay. All other type things, simply suspicious activity, a speeding vehicle, a person walking, uh, possibly a, a window knocked out of a, of a uh, home or something of that nature, uh, a suspicious vehicle in the driveway, anything like that that you see, it's not an emergency. It's not an immediate life threat. And those you dial 669-4181. You get our dispatcher, uh, and you can tell them what's going on. OK? 
Okay? So it's pretty clear. If it's if it's life or property threatening, you use 911. You know, if it's just a speeding car going down the road, that's not a 911 call. The 911 operator doesn't want to be tied up on that kind of call, give it straight to our dispatcher. Alright? What do you what do what do we need to do? Your first responsibility is to stay calm and stay observant and tell what you see. It takes a little while to do that. I'm going to tell you, you know, Stan can tell you, when you first get in this business and the first crisis you run into, nobody stays calm. It takes a little crisis. The fire department, you know, you've been to enough fires, you can get there and you can use your good professional judgment and you can determine what you need to do at that scene and who needs to do it and you can stay in control. Now, I tell all of our new guys, and I, when I was one, you know, there'll be a time where if you want to cry, we'll cry together. You want to go throw up, we'll go throw up together. You know. But while it's going on, you got to stay calm. <laughs> so you got the advantage. There's two of you instead of one of you. Your, your basic instructions are to remain in the car, and your basic challenge is to remain calm. Breathe slow. Keep your eyes open. Don't get tunnel vision. Don't just look at one little spot, but look at the whole picture and, and report what you see. Right? When you, if you stay calm and you tell the operator who you are, <coughs> you're with the Chelsea Citizens Patrol, and I am at you know, a certain location, and this is what I see. Right? They're going to ask you some questions. And these are pretty experienced dispatchers. They're going to ask, they're going to help you provide what they need to hear. It'll help you to know what they're going to be looking for. Uh, you need to identify what the problem is. You know, if it's an emergency or if it's just a suspicious situation. Uh, there, if you're talking about a person, and in here you've got a form to go by. It says they're going to want a description of a person. Start at the top, go to the bottom. It's a very simple process. If you practice it, it'll become second nature. Every day in the course of your day, if you drive or work or whatever, you pass a person, take just a split instant, and say, if I had to describe them, how would I do it? And you start at the top, you know, half, hair, whatever. On TV, you know, they want to tell you he was six foot two, 200 pounds. You know, that's not how we're going to catch them. We're going to catch them because they were six foot tall, tall guy, had gray hair, glasses, blue shirt. You know, we'll measure him and weigh him when we get him to jail. <laughs> we'll work those details out. We'll know how much he weighs and how tall he is because we'll take a picture with that chart behind him. And, you know, what we're looking for is hat, no hat, long hair, blue shirt, blue jeans, white tennis shoes. You know, the more detail you can give us, the better. White male, black male, Hispanic, um, you know, uh, anything like that. Any particular details that you can give us that are unusual obviously will help us. No shoes, things like that. But just get your system. Practice it. Top to bottom. Say, how would I describe that person? And you'll find yourself in a short period of time doing it second nature. Anybody you pass, you can take a quick look at them and it'll hook up. Good point was made by Jay about writing down, keeping notes. Write it down because all of us that start to get gray hair or no hair, things slip away. Write it down because the next day they may come back and need some information from you and you're much better off if you made some notes <coughs> that you can refer back to. Okay? You're going to describe a car the same way as a person. Start at the top and work down. You know, there was a time in my life I could tell you a 57, 58, 59 Chevrolet Ford. I could tell you what engine was in them, what radios you had as options, how many horsepower they had, the whole nine yards. I can't tell you a Buick from a Mitsubishi from a <laughs> anymore. They all look a lot. So it's a small car, medium sized car, large car. Two door or four door. Start at the top. It's white over black. You know, whatever the colors are. Obviously if you can get the tag number, that's the key item. The tag number is the key item because it gives us something you know, to refine your description by in a potential owner. So tag number is real important and that's part of that write it down. Write it down because you think you got it, and 30 seconds later, when you're trying to tell the dispatcher, you start getting a little confused. Uh, in some crises, we've had people call the dispatcher and couldn't remember their own name, so you know you can understand how you might not get quite get the tag number right. Try and write it down. Um, if there's
some unusual characteristic about a vehicle. Uh, loud mufflers, tail light out, you know, things of that nature are real helpful because again, these deputies out here coming to you looking for this car are going to find it because it's a, it's a blue car, big car, loud exhaust, and got a tail light out. That's going to be a lot easier to find than you think. Now, in Shelby County, there are a few vehicles that don't have all the fenders and doors the same color. So if it has, a, if it has an unusual characteristic, like a, you know, blue fender, y'all, y'all may not know this. Your Chelsea post office—it was burglarized several years back. The guy that did that broke in the welding shop there on 47 and stole a cutting torch. He went over and broke in the post office in the middle of the night. And this is like out of the old days. Nobody does this. He cut the safe. I mean, he took a cutting torch and cut the safe in the post office. Well, he was doing fine. Except it never occurred to him that the mail people bring today's mail about 4 o'clock in the morning and dump it off. <laughs> and he's in there. <laughs> so the truck pulls in and goes, ooh, there's a car behind the post office. Wonder what's up. Backs out, comes right across the street to the uh, convenience store and gets on the phone. Calls the sheriff's office. While he's talking on the sheriff's office, now the guy said, oops, I got big trouble. You know, somebody's pulled in the back of this place. He grabs his duffel bag of goodies he's gathered up, bolts out, jumps in his car, and tears out on the 280. Well, as he turns, he was driving, help me remember, was it a blue Ford Torino with a red door or the other way around? Blue Ford Torino with a red driver's door. <laughs> And this guy's on the phone, and there he goes down to me, describes him, okay? We didn't catch him that night. We put the information out on the local computer for all the law enforcement agencies. Homewood PD investigator called us the next day, and he said, you know, he said, I got a guy up here that would do that. And he drives a car with a red tow. <laughs> well, got with the feds, uh, postal inspectors, did a little research, took them a day or so, got a search warrant, went up to his house, and yeah, he had a Ford Torino with a red door, and in his home was a duffel bag with 17,000 postage stamps in it. And when they asked him, where'd you get this? He said, found it in the back seat of my car. So uh, he's still in jail. I don't think he'll <laughs> he won't be back to rob your post office for a while. But seriously, that was how he was caught, red door on a blue car. So those are the kind of things that are, that are really useful to us. Uh, and, and if you see that or can do it, that's fine. Uh, direction of travel is important. Uh, your, your instructions here are to, <coughs> to stay, you know, stay away, don't get involved. Nothing says you can't drive the speed limit. If they're going this direction, you can go along with them. And if you see them hit 280 and turn right or turn left and you can give us a direction of travel, great. You know, you've kept them in sight and you had not violated the law, you had not put yourself in jeopardy, but you've given us a direction of travel so that these guys know where to head to to try and cut them off. Number of occupants in the car would be helpful. You know, pay attention to that. How many are in there? Uh, that sort of thing. Boys or girls, uh, front seat, back seat, things of that nature. That, that might help a spot. Um, and again, they're going to they're gonna want you to tell them why you're interested in this car, what's going on, what drew your attention to it. And stay on the line. Our dispatchers may go away for put you on hold and say, you know, because they're going to be talking on the radio to him. But don't hang up. Stay with them until they tell you to hang up. Uh, and they probably are going to want to get that cell phone number where they can reach you back, you know, if need be. Glenn, do we need to answer that, or whose phone is that ringing? I, I don't know. It's not ringing on this. It sounds like your deputy's office. <laughs> Okay, so we've kind of, uh, and there's a statement down here on page six that I honestly want you to operate this patrol on this basis. The sheriff's office would much rather respond to a call where they are not needed than not be called. Let me tell you how I explain that. I, I, when I give these talks to, to a group of folks or whatever, I say, look, you're at home, two o'clock in the afternoon, and you see a van go down your street, a few minutes later, it goes back the other way. A few minutes later, it's back this way. Call us. We would much rather come out and find out that's a guy trying to deliver a sofa from a furniture company, and he can't find the street or the address, or he doesn't quite have good information. We'd rather help him find the address. We're not going to help him unload the sofa. But if we can direct him, we'd rather do that 
and find out it was a couple of burglars looking for a likely house, and we don't get a, a chance at them. So if, you, if your instincts tell you something's wrong, trust your instincts. I, I usually, I, for the next meeting, I'll bring you an article. It's a copy out of Reader's Digest about listen to your fears. All of us are, are inherently equipped with a system that warns us. And when your system tells you something's wrong, believe it. Don't argue it down. Don't convince yourself that, oh, there's nothing to that. That doesn't amount to anything. When whatever that, the hair stands up on the back of your neck or whatever it is, you know, that, that is your tip-off, believe it. One of the things that I believe keeps law enforcement officers alive in the situations we get in is we have learned to listen to that, that internal fear. When something tells us something's wrong, it is wrong. And, and we're a little bit more attuned to it, and we're a little more likely to sharpen up the instincts and look out than, than most people have a tendency to argue it down and say there's nothing to it. As you do this, let that feeling tell you when something's wrong. When you pass a person or a car or a situation and something tells you, you know, that just didn't look quite right. Believe it. Go back and take another look. And, that, and if, you, if you feel like it's not right, then you need to let us know. All right. Um, we know what to expect here. Um, advice for patrols. Okay. Uh, this is page seven we're going to talk about. And we've already covered this a pretty good bit about you're the eyes and ears. If we did not have folks like you, whether it's an organized citizen's patrol or just to call us and tell us what was going on, there's only... 82 of us, 77 of us, and we're going to get to hire five more. So there will only be 82 sworn officers of the Shelby County Sheriff's Office in this old county at this point in time. Now, you divide out 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and how many folks you think can be on duty at any given one time, uh, we could make a dent in it if people didn't tell us what was going on and give us help and lead us. So that's where you can materially impact what goes on around here. I, I believe that citizens get the quality of law enforcement that they demand. If a citizen's group has an incident happen and the law enforcement officers arrive and they say, who did the shooting? And the answer is, we didn't see anything. If they said, who was the guy on the corner in the blue shirt and the ball cap? And, they, and the answer is, we don't know those citizens will get the quality of law enforcement that they demand. They'll get nothing. The next time that officer goes down there, he ain't going to go down there and get shot at for nobody to tell him anything. He's going to take his time, drive by, roll the window down, and say, man, it looked all right to me. But if he goes down there and people say, here's what happened, here's who they were, there's where they went, that's the kind of response you're going to get from your law enforcement officer. He's going to get there in a hurry because he's going to get help. He's going to get people helping him, telling him, aiming and pointing and, and, and standing up and saying, yeah, that's him, officer. The one you got in the back seat, well, that's the one I saw throw the brick through the window. So that's why your eyes and ears are important. That's why you are helping everybody that lives in Chelsea. Because you're going to demand a good quality of law enforcement, and you're going to provide that assistance that you're going to justify. Uh, that's, what, that's what we like to see. Never become directly involved in an incident or a problem. Can't stress that enough. We're not asking you to take action. We're not asking you to put yourself in harm's way. You know, Stan and his guys are wearing bulletproof vests, or carrying weapons, or carrying mace, or carrying flashlights, or carrying handcuffs. They have trained and trained and trained. Stan is a longtime law enforcement officer. He's been a tag team member. He's been an instructor. Uh, he's extremely qualified to take care of himself and his people. You don't get that way overnight. We don't want you to take any kind of action that would put you in harm's way. Our goal at the end of each shift is that these guys go home every night. That's your goal. Go home. Go home safe. No damage. Nobody hurt. Nothing. No cars did it. You go home. That's that's the point. Uh, that's why we say don't pursue any vehicles. Don't ex don't drive ex exceed the speed limit. You know. Don't take any chances. Don't carry any weapons. Jay covered that. We don't want you to even have the temptation that you might
might say, I've got to go do something. I've got my gun under the seat. I've got to go see where that guy went. You don't want to do that. Because when he gets here, and you're in the dark behind the building with a gun, he doesn't know who the bad guy is. Okay? 